agree with that. Yes. And here we go. Um, so the business club is there to bring together people from various uh, interest groups in quantum industry, academia, but also investment once per quarter, usually hybrid. It's one hour and we try to keep this um, as strict as possible. And there is one kind of uh, timely theme per event. There is always an IQM business update from our hosts. Then there is a technical presentation that is brought together in a panel discussion. And uh, today on the next slide, we have a, a topic that uh, looks a bit nerdy, but that is in fact also near and dear to my heart. You know, I did not define it, IQM proposed it. It's a control and of quantum systems and quantum error mitigation. Um, that is essentially all the work that traditionally has been done by theoretical physicists and by computer scientists on a very technical level. That essentially means that given hardware, which we are, which is still being improved community-wide, which is still less than perfect, you're getting the best possible algorithmic performance. It brings together three areas. So, and it is kind of one of these things deep in the stack that can make a difference between uh, good performance and great performance. And it's a bit nerdy, um, but um, um, you will see, you know, why it's important to have this on the spec sheet of your future quantum computer. Um, again, now is the moment uh, to uh, remind yourself to switch off your microphone and your camera uh, to make the YouTube recording uh, really something that we would like to upload uh, en masse. Um, next slide. So uh, you're currently suffering through the welcome mark, uh, remarks from me. And then there's a business update from an IQM representative. I think it wasn't completely clear whether Jan Götz himself could make it. And uh, then we have three speakers that will really address the three levels, the computer science level, the theoretical physics level, and the experimental physics and engineering level of uh, getting um, most out of your hardware, addressed by uh, Glenn Beng, Armin Hossein Kani, and Stefan Philipp. They will then come together and discuss those topics, and then we will close. Uh, with that, uh, let me hand over while really everybody is switching off their camera to the business update. Okay, uh, so hello. Uh, yeah, as pointed out before, Jan unfortunately cannot make it. So I take um, the business update today. So hello, my name is uh, Stefan Sank. I'm a marketing manager at IQM working from IQM's Munich office. So uh, the business update is on me today um, and I will do my best to present uh, all our great news. Uh, so we've had many uh, important announcements over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, here you can see a snapshot taken right from our website. So uh, please uh, check out the About Us for Media tab at our website for more information on these topics uh, after the session. Okay, so um, the IQM team has actually just returned from the SC23. And this is the International Conference for High Performance Computing, Networking, Storage, and Analysis held in Denver and US. So we had a good presence at the show and uh, two related uh, press announcements in the last few days. So first we launched IQM Radiance, a 150 qubit system paving the way to quantum advantage. Uh, IQM Radiance comes actually in two variants, uh, 54 qubits. The target availability for it is Q3 2024 and uh, 150 qubit version, the target availability is Q1 2025. So IQM Radiance, is designed for businesses, high performance computing centers, also data centers, and also government agencies. Uh, we do have uh, actually uh, a quote from Jan on this. So this is the right moment for businesses to uh, invest and harness quantum advantage as early as possible. IQM Radiance allows enterprises to target real life use cases and test applications with the most business potential. And the high potential areas include machine learning, cybersecurity, system control, energy grid, and route optimization, 
also drug and chemical research and carbon capture. And then uh, second on the list here, so uh, IKM quantum computers to advance future hybrid quantum applications with NVIDIA just from uh, last week. And the collaboration will enable users of quantum computers uh, and uh, IKM quantum pro processing units to program hybrid quantum classical applications with NVIDIA CUDA quantum. So our vision here is to make the integration of quantum and classical systems accessible to scientists and experts. And um, the future as we see it is quantum accelerated supercomputing. So quantum computers and supercomputers working in combo to solve the most important and pressing problems. So it is all about uh, the coupling of quantum with GPU uh, supercomputing, which could drive uh, breakthroughs, innovation in science industry and HPC. So uh, this is one of our biggest announcements ever. So these systems to offer customers access to IQM quantum systems through the cloud. Uh, we communicated this end of July. So these systems customers will be able to train their skills and develop use cases on IQM's quantum infrastructure. And this allow uh, this access will be integrated into T Systems Cloud landscape as well. So T Systems will also offer its customers dedicated quantum know-how and training. So just right uh, for the needs. And these range uh, from one day introductory sessions through business case POCs over several months. So all in partnership with IQM and that of course makes us very, very proud indeed. And uh, we do also have a good news from Korea. So Norma and IQM quantum computers have signed an MAU paving the way for the introduction of quantum computers in South Korea. So uh, with this MOU, both companies actually have agreed to collaborate in various areas, including the introduction and expansion of quantum computers. And we will also look at joint development of applications using quantum algorithms and joint implementation of quantum education programs. So also here we have a quote from Jan. So we are delighted to be partnering with Norma to promote the growth of the South Korean quantum computing ecosystem. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, yeah, IQM Spark. Uh, this is our entry level quantum computer for less, for less than 1 million euros at uh, SQA 23. A few weeks ago, we launched the IQM Spark. It's our low cost quantum computer for universities and labs. And uh, the IQM Spark is extremely cost efficient with a price point of less than 1 million euros. And it is aimed at universities starting a quantum program. So the IQM Spark uh, is combined with our quantum education program uh, that you probably already know, which is uh, IQM Academy. So uh, also full hardware access is possible, including pulse control. And this is all included in the offer. Uh, scientists can perform selected ex experiments such as calibration. This is very important calibration. And the interaction of hardware and software can be studied more intensively. So uh, IQM has now fully completed the system delivery integration and also testing of the 20 qubit system at VTT. Uh, VTT has actually officially accepted now the tested system and has already published a result of the performance evaluation. So VTT is already seeing an increased demand for the system at the 20 qubit node. Um, and this, because this uh, node can actually lead to more interesting quantum investigations. So the question is what is next for VTT? Uh, this is the delivery of the 54 qubit QPU and this is planned for H1 2024. Uh, at LRZ, we are also in the process of finalizing the delivery, integration, and testing of the 20 qubit system. So the LRZ has two, two 20 qubit systems, one for QXA and one for DAC. And on the right side here, we see Jan Götz and Professor Kranzenmüller signing the original QXA contract. And indeed, a lot has happened since then. So stay tuned uh, for more information, more news to come on that front. So I'm giving back the control to Frank for the speaker. Thank you. Well, it's you keep the electronic control. Um, thanks a lot. So um, I don't know for the education system is Black is there Black Friday pricing tomorrow or no? Um, 
maybe that's another topic. Um, let's uh, now move to our more technical presentations. And we are look at how to get uh, the most out of your hardware first from a computer science uh, perspective by Glenn Bang of uh, Parity QC. So Glenn, please uh, share your screen. And I'll give you a two minute warning. So after you've spoken for eight minutes, Glenn, are you still there? Yes, I'm here uh, and I'm gonna share my screen. There's one question on the chat that we can uh, bring back to the end. I think Spark is not only for universities, but that's the target audience is my understanding. So Glenn Bang of uh, Parity QC tells us about error mitigation for QAOA. Okay, thank you very much, Frank. So I'm gonna talk today about uh, error mitigation for uh, quantum approximate optimization. So the main issue that uh, we usually target with this uh, with this uh, algorithm is uh, the optimization of uh, combinatorial uh, uh, functions. So in this case, we have problems that come both from uh, uh, the science science uh, part and problems that come both from uh, industry, so logistics, production, and graph optimization. What we do usually is that we pass from the minimization of a cost function to the problem of finding the ground state of a quantum system, which in this case becomes uh, uh, encoded in these uh, parameters that uh, appear in a quantum Hamiltonian. So from the perspective of optimization, there are various algorithms that have been uh, uh, proposed. I will mainly discuss the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, which has the advantages that is suitable to run on digital to quantum computing. It uses the diabetic theorem to assure that it's going to converge to the exact minimum that we are looking for. And uh, it also exploits property of quantum mechanics, such as tunneling uh, between uh, local minima to achieve, the, to, to achieve the solution faster than classical devices. So the algorithm in uh, detail works like this. Uh, usually we would start from a quantum circuit and uh, run the quantum circuit in order to prepare a target, a, a certain state. Then we do measurements on the quantum circuit to uh, measure our cost function uh, and its value that it has on this target state. And finally, using some classical uh, algorithm, we suggest new parameter for the quantum circuit and run again the quantum circuit. We repeat this uh, operation many times until we get a state that uh, it's a good enough solution to our initial optimization problem. So this kind of algorithm is suitable to run on uh, uh, quantum devices, but it has one technical difficulty. And that is that it requires uh, the qubits within the architecture to be able to uh, interact even when they're at long distances. For example, in this case, qubit three and four are required to be uh, able to interact. One solution, one possible solution to this is using swap networks. So we swap iteratively each spins here on the dashed line until we can bring the two spin, the two qubits we want to interact uh, close to each other. And uh, this is quite costly because it requires us to uh, introduce new gates in the algorithm uh, in order to do this, perform these swaps. Another possibility is one that we study and uh, we are developing at, at Parity QC is, if, is using the Parity paradigm. In this case, this uh, long uh, uh, interaction that are required to be encoded in the, in the quantum system are now in, encoded in individual spins or qubits. So as you see, the red a qubit here that is here drawn encodes the interaction three four. So to manipulate this uh, uh, this interaction, we are required only to manipulate this qubit. So we do not need this long range interaction anymore. However, since now uh, interactions are uh, encoded in qubits and uh, the number of qubits is uh, higher than before, we are required to, to introduce also local uh, for body constraints. And here each constraint says that the number of zeros uh, of ones in touching this plaquette has to be even, zero, two, or four. Again, this, this can also be implemented with gates and is suitable to run on digital devices. 
So the paritic gesture, as I've uh, described now, is uh, suitable to run on basically most of the architectures that are already available, such as trap ions, cold atoms, and superconducting qubits. And uh, using uh, co the compiler that uh, uh, we have developed within the company, it's possible to go from different uh, problem connectivities. So we have this prob these hard problems that uh, would require such a complicated uh, uh, architecture that can be encoded into 2D layouts that are ready to be, um, uh, to be put in production as uh, into chips. So when uh, running quantum algorithm, one of the main issues that we have to deal with is the presence of errors. So what are errors in, in this particular one that I've discussed? So in the, due to the encoding that we, we have a surplus of qubits, if we have no errors in our system, as in the first case that I'm showing here, we have that all the constraints I described before of uh, having an even number of ones are satisfied. And uh, when we attempt to decode our state, so that means to go back to the uh, solution of the original problem, we get independently of which set of uh, qubits we use for the decoding, we always get the right solution. And here you see for this case I showed the right solution is uh, all uh, spins up or all bits one, and we get this independently of the three we chose. However, if we choose different set of qubits, when we have a solution that is uh, wrong or has been perturbed by noise. So in this case, we have that uh, because of some noise process, qubit one, uh, so some qubits have been flipped to one, we will get that this uh, procedure of going back uh, that we call decoding is going to produce different states and uh, the states are going to differ. However, if we have a set of qubits that we're using for the decoding that does not involve the one which have been uh, perturbed by noise, this will still return the right, uh, the right solution. So we use this uh, decoding strategies that is uh, to uh, transform, to get, to, to get from our uh, state to a set of logical states to modify the algorithm like this. So here is the same. We run the quantum circuit, we do the measurements, but we add an additional phase. This is decoding into multiple states. And now we using these multiple states, we do again suggestion of change of parameters and we run the algorithm until we get to the state we are looking for. And this actually, uh, it's an improvement and the, the improvement depends on the number of decoded states we allow. And here I show a plot that uh, shows that the success probability, so the probability that the algorithm is successful in finding the minimum, uh, increases as we increase the number of the states that we're using for the decoding. Finally, uh, we actually benchmark the algorithm and compared this approach with the standard swap network approach. So within the standard swap network approach... Herzlich willkommen bei Rehakral Therapie, Ihr Ansprechpartner im Bereich Physiotherapie, Ergotherapie und Logopädie in Spardorf und Umgebung. Sorry, is, did I, did I, okay, sorry. So um, we... Switch off your microphones, everybody, if you're not the speaker. Okay, so we, so, so sorry, let me get back to the slide. This is the last slide. So in this case, we compare the this approach that I just described, that uh, it's error mitigated parity quantum approximate optimization algorithm to the usual approach with swap networks. So within the approach with swap networks, we have less qubits. So we're gonna have to, in, to make a fair comparison, we're gonna have to use more qubits within the swap network, so repeat the algorithm and give the swap network uh, access to these more qubits to perform better. And within the parity uh, uh, architecture, we have more qubits, but these more qubits can be effectively used for error correction. So the question is, is, is it better to, to have an algorithm which has more qubits and error correction, or an algorithm which does not have error correction but has less qubits? So according to our simulations, we show that uh, the parity, uh, the algorithm based on the parity architecture performs better than the one based on the swap networks, also in presence of imperfection and, no and noise within the quantum gates. Indeed, we see that although the 
success probability de decays as expected as the noise increases, so it becomes harder to, for the quantum computation to be effective. The approach using the parity architecture uh, maintains success probability that are always higher and, uh, than the one using the swap networks. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you, Glenn. And we have time for a question. Maybe while Amin is already switching on to his slides and uh, Glenn is uh, liberating the screen. So other questions to Glenn? Well, it, if you come up with a question later, there will be opportunity to feed it into the podium discussion. But now we uh, continue with uh, IQM's own Amin Hossein Khani, whose office used to be over here uh, a long time ago, who will uh, take us a bit uh, uh, kind of in the, into the middle of the problem, into the center of the problem with noise robust error mitigation. Please. We don't hear you yet. Yeah, sorry, I was muted and I have to. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much, Frank. Um, let me also thank the organizers in IQM for giving me the opportunity to present my results. I'm going to talk about the new error mitigation technique that I developed uh, in collaboration with my colleagues uh, uh, we, who are uh, uh, pretend here, Alessio Calzano, Adrian Auer, and Ines de Vega. So as we know, um, Quantum information is very fragile. Uh, qubit lifetimes is short and limited, and therefore quantum gates are faulty. And this makes it a huge challenge uh, for us to perform quantum computing. Um, in the future, when we have many, many uh, number of qubits and also already good fidelities, uh, what we can do is to perform quantum error correction in the sense that we use long range correlations of entangled quantum many body states that are ex expected to be robust against perturbations. Uh, at, at this time, however, we do not have so many physical qubits. And what we can do is to actually perform quantum error mitigation. Here, the idea is to actually accept that there is a, a physical noise at the hardware. And what we intend to do is to come up with a strategy that enables us to reduce the effect of the noise on the outcome of a quantum circuit execution. And there are a lot of different uh, quantum error mitigation strategies, but essentially all of them, what they do is that they basically tell us that if we have to modify the original target circuit in certain different ways, we have to have many different circuits, and then we have to post-process the results in a certain way in order to basically find an estimation for the noiseless expectation value that we are looking for. And because for this approach, we do not need many physical qubits, it is applicable right now for the NISC devices. Um, for quantum error mitigation, as I mentioned, there are a lot of different techniques, uh, but basically one can put all different techniques into two general categories. There is a category of noise aware uh, quantum error mitigation in which one requires a detailed knowledge about the hardware noise to be able to perform quantum error mitigation. And the other category is actually noise agnostic in which a user does not need to, basically does not need to know anything about the noise. And the technique that I'm um, presenting today in REM, is basically belonging to the category of noise agnostic error mitigations. And it was initially actually designed to tackle some main challenges of another technique, which is called zero noise extrapolation. And let me give you a brief review about what is zero noise extrapolation. This is basically zero noise extrapolation in a nutshell. What we do is that we measure the observable of interest at various scales for the noise. So basically lambda one here means that it's our background noise and we assume that we can actually amplify the noise. So for example, lambda two means that we have twice noise as lambda one. Then what we do is that we just measure them and then we fit them to a specific function and this enables us to find some estimation. Of course, this estimation is not really the exact value and therefore there is always going to be a bias error. And the reason there is a bias error here is basically there are two main reasons. First is that the best mathematical fit function is not clear what kind of mathematical fit function it is. And second, uh, it is actually 
uh, crucial that we should be able to really precisely amplify the noise because if what we implement is not we intended to implement, it will basically manifest itself into a bias error. Um, this is NREM in a nutshell. So what we do there is actually we split between the inner layer, which is collecting some noisy expectation value from the outer layer, which is the extrapolation by a middle layer, which is performing some noise canceling process. And as I'm going to show you, this enabled us to actually achieve much better results in comparison with zero noise extrapolation. So the amount of bias noise in zero noise extrapolation is of course unknown. And the core idea for NREM is that we establish a connection between this unknown bias error to a tunable cost function via an educated guess. And we show that by implementing an REM in such a way that the cost function is minimized, the bias error is significantly reduced. And furthermore, this enables our technique to tolerate inaccuracies in the noise amplification. So as I mentioned before, we wish that the one to know uh, noise-free um, expectation value of a certain observable, for that we have to prepare a target state. Uh, and in our target quantum uh, circuit, basically we have a bunch of single qubit gates and a bunch of two qubit gates. And one has, to, one has to note that we should definitely have some non Clifford gates here if we want to have uh, basically quantum advantage. And what we can do is that we can only measure the noisy of observables. In NREM, what we do is that we actually construct a different circuit, which, which we call the noise canceling circuit from the target circuit. And this can be achieved, for example, by keeping only a very, very few number of non Clifford gates and replacing um, the majority of non Clifford gates with a certain Clifford gate. So this a specific circuit we can actually simulate so we can know what is the ideal value. And actually we can also measure the noisy expectation value in this case. What we do is that instead of extrapolating the observable of interest, we construct another observable or that we call it auxiliary quantity. And the purpose of having this auxiliary quantity, which is defined in this way, is that, so as you see, noise basically enters here and also noise enters here. So it's intuitively clear that there is a competition between the noises here. The purpose of introducing this function M is that we want the auxiliary quantity to be less sensitive to the noise. If that's the case, then it's obvious then that extrapolating this new observable, which is less sensitive to noise, is going to achieve us more accurate results because we already start with the less amount of noise. So here we have two uh, quantities. First, noise canceling circuit. So well, what is the best noise canceling circuit that we can come up with? And second is a tunable control parameter, which is this exponent n. And the question is, how can I basically fine tune noise canceling circuit and the tunable control parameter? For that, the argument is the following. So as I mentioned, we want the, auxil the auxiliary quantity to be less sensitive against the noise. So we ask the question, how can we quantify the effect of the noise? And the answer that we propose is that the effect of the noise can be quantified by the dispersion of the noisy expectation values. So it's uh, obvious that in the ideal case that the effect of the noise is completely removed from the auxiliary quantity. It doesn't matter what no noise scale we are looking at these things should be equal together in, in that ideal case. If that's the case, then, then the cost function becomes zero. So the work line is the following. Among a pool of candidates to be used as noise canceling circuits, we select the one that minimizes the cost function. And in this case, for simplicity, we assume n is one. Once we fix the noise canceling circuit, then actually we try to find the optimal control parameter by numerically minimizing this cost function. So then we also find the control parameter after that, we construct our auxiliary observable and then we extrapolate it to the limit where noise goes to zero. Now, let me show you some results. So uh, as a case study, I, I analyzed the ground state energy of this transverse Ising system in the presence of the noise. Uh, I observed that in the presence of the noise, what I got from my QAOA analysis is off from the ideal value by around uh, 30%. Now I implement an REM. Uh, this is my first result. Here, basically, we assume that there is no control parameter. We are only changing the noise canceling circuit. What you see there is the relative bias error as a function of dispersion. 
each data point corresponds to NREM for a specific choice for the noise canceling circuit. And what you see, and the red ones are actually the average of the blue data points. What you observe is that indeed, once I select a noise canceling circuit such that the dispersion is reduced, the relative bias error is also significantly reduced. To put it into more context, actually, if I look at this good corner there, for the same problem, if I implement zero noise extrapolation, uh, at the end, I'm left with 7% bias error. However, once I am there and I do an REM, uh, the average number is actually 0.2% of the bias error. Uh, then for the full NREM, I also have this exponent n. As I mentioned, we find the exponent n by numerically minimizing this. And then I put it back and then I extrapolate. This is one example of how it looks like. So basically, these are the three uh, noisy uh, observables. And this is the output for zero noise extrapolation. For NREM, you see that they are actually on a flat line. And you see here that we really hit the target. The important thing is that because they are almost on a flat line, if this guy here, for example, if it is not three, but a bit more than three or a bit smaller than three, it really doesn't matter because they are on a flat line anyway. So we expect that an REM can tolerate inaccuracies in the noise amplification. And uh, to really show it, we try to model it theoretically. So we assume that we have an intended noise scale factor in this form. And also we, we assume that there is an error in this intended noise scale factor. So basically we use this to perform extrapolation, whereas we use this to perform noisy simulations. And that's actually our results. So the x-axis is this delta, which is capturing inaccuracies in the noise amplification. For NREM, we see that it is actually pretty much intolerant, or basically it's very much less sensitive compared with zero noise extrapolation. And we, we also have to note that you just don't know what is the value of delta, whether it's there or there. In zero noise extrapolation, you see that it is extremely sensitive to the B, to the inaccuracies that we might have in the noise amplification. And the third result is actually now I simulated eight qubits in open boundary condition. Again, we observe the similar behavior, whereas here, for example, we see that there's actually two orders of magnitude improvement in the ideal case for a noise robust error mitigation compared with the standard zero noise extrapolation. Um, with this, I would like to con uh, conclude. Um, an REM is a noise agnostic error mitigation technique with very promising performances. To, to do it, we use the same quantum processor to implement a target quantum circuit and also to implement a noise canceling circuit. The, the post-processing contains basically quantifying the hardware noise via tracking the dispersion of the noise data. And this can be used to form basically a feedback loop to then choose the proper noise canceling circuit. And at the end, once a good noise canceling circuit is found, we use it to perform uh, post-processing and we basically get a nice error mitigation. Um, so far via simulations, we achieved very good results. We also defined, I have to say, a refined version of NREM with even better results than what I presented today. We also truly analyzed the sampling overhead of the technique, which I didn't talk about. And at the moment, we are writing down a paper. It is still not an archive yet, but hopefully it will be an archive soon. And let me also say that while the NREM paper, which is something on error mitigation, is not available yet, our team recently also put out a nice article on noise mitigation at the hardware level, specifically relevant for supercomputers. You know that, right? Yes, yes. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Great, thanks a lot. Um, I would have a lot of questions, but I saved them for the panel discussion. So while uh, Stefan is posted, is uh, starting to share screen, is there an immediate question to Armin? Then we hear from uh, Stefan Philipp, uh, the director of the Walter Meister Institute of the Bavarian Academy of Sciences about uh, characterization and control of quantum systems. Yeah, so thanks, thanks Frank. Thanks for the invitation and for giving me the chance also to bring in a little bit of experiment and uh, qubits that are actually on uh, the hardware system. So I want to also discuss about errors, but also then about a slightly different, not a random error, but also errors that occur if you control the system. If we have the wrong pulses, there also occur errors. 
and we can kind of avoid them. And we can avoid them also by better control, by better characterization of what these pulses to do to the system. Let me iterate a bit on what we actually want, what is the vision. When we don't have errors, then we could just build a quantum computer, but we have errors. So we have to build uh, on top of the physical quantum processor, we have to put some logical la layers. We have to put error correction layers, and that's the holy grail. We want to build logical qubits where we can do some error correction schemes that actually provide us then with the best algorithm without any errors at the end. So that's kind of the vision that we are all up for. As we have heard, so we are not yet there. So if we look at what is kind of the errors that we are getting, so this experiment then shows that for these logical qubits, we get around 3%. So that's quite a lot at the moment. So we're at this stage where we're looking for different techniques, different techniques in coping with these errors, which is not correcting them, but as we have heard, mitigating those. Mitigating those means that we get rid of this logical error layer. We get rid of the um, correction scheme and try to find algorithms, find the schemes that allow us to run these algorithms already on the physical scheme. So exploring these applications that can be done before error correction comes into play. What is the system that we are using? So we like superconducting qubits. There is many systems around at the moment that are quite promising. Superconducting qubits is certainly one of those. We like them because it's they give us high fidelity gate operations. They are built on nonlinear superconducting circuits. You see, for example, one of them here. So that's a qubit here. Here's the nonlinear element, this Josephson junction. And we get stable operation. We can scalably fabricate those. So we can build quantum processors that we can run them in dilution fridges that you see here on the left side. What is the challenge? What are the challenges? So first, we have this challenge to build a system out of that. It's not enough to have a few qubits, but we run. We have to run a stable system and have to have an operation system. Then we need to scale up. It's also not good enough that we have a few qubits that work well, but we have to guarantee that when building systems out of many hundreds, thousands, millions of qubits at the end, we still, it shouldn't perform, uh, uh, it shouldn't degrade performance of the qubit. And then, the most relevant property is coherence. We have to maximize the lifetime of quantum states, identifying noise channels, loss channels, noise sources. So that's kind of, we have to do at all to get quantum coherence. But then there's also, we have to work on control and read out. As said, it is, as noise, it is an error source if we are not able to control the system properly. So we have to avoid this control and read out errors and get to high fidelity gates that are only limited by the coherence. So let me talk a bit about that, what this means. So let's have a closer look at the system. What are we doing to the system to prepare quantum states? So that's the system. We shine in microwaves in the superconducting qubit case. And what is then done is that we are exciting some excited state here, this state. At the same time, the system might not be a perfect qubit with only zero and one state. There might be other levels around this two state. So the challenge is now by sending in these pulses to avoid, for example, this leakage into this state here, which would be an error in our computation. So we have to mitigate this. We have to shape, we have to calibrate the pulses properly, and we have to do this efficiently. For example, we can now, for each time bin, we can choose now what is the amplitude of the pulse to get a perfect pi half or a pi pulse. If it comes into experiments, that's a little bit more tedious. We have to send in first the prior. We have to send in how the pulse should look like into the uh, into the system, and then we have to run an optimization loop. We have to run an optimization loop which integrates, which involves also the system itself. We have to look for the response function because there might be errors on the way. So, and that's kind of a time-consuming effort in optimizing the parameters of this pulse using a measure of fidelity, like a randomized benchmarking and then come out with what is the final pulse, the best pulse. So here an example of what it did also in collaboration and based on the work of our chair, Frank Wilhelm Mauch, we came up with a fast single qubit pulses that show that by optimizing running this pulse shape gives better fidelity values than just running an analytically found pulse. And here we could optimize over 55 parameters. 
The challenge still is how to do this rapidly. We need this optimal, we need this uh, control uh, optimization loop, which takes time because we have to measure the system. So we could analyze, I could go more in detail here. What is the time used now and where is the time spent? And one uh, huge portion of this time that is spent is actually waiting for the qubit to relax. That's called this T1 time. So if we just wait, if we do something, the qubit is in its excited state, we have to wait until it relaxes back to the ground state. And then this causes actually a waiting time that we could use better because we want to save time on uh, these calibration loops. There are several methods we could reset. There are several schemes now where we say we do apply some pulses after this measurement, these reset pulses that bring us back to the ground state. That there are several uh, realizations of that. There is also another way we could do post-processing. We say, because we measure the state after the experiment, we know already which state it's in and we use this knowledge and then for the calibration sequence. And this gives actually quite nice results without doing any extra pulses on the system. Here we tried it with a different, slightly different type of qubit, so-called fluxonium devices that we have. And here we see, for example, that we can nicely calibrate high fidelity single qubit gates, 99.96 fidelity. And we can get the same fidelity either by doing this normal scheme where we have this reset by waiting for a, a, a few T1 times, or we do this restless, this fast scheme where we don't have to wait in between. We're getting similar or equivalent results here for the gate fidelities, but for more than tenfold in faster in time. And that already brings me to the conclusion. What I have to show you is that we have to care about how to control the pulses. We want to get fast, high fidelity, single qubit gates, also more qubit, two qubit gates. We have to find scheme actually how to do this fast and efficiently because it's really we have to deal with the hardware. And the outlook is then to apply these uh, methods for optimizing two qubit gates and also for larger scale devices that we have currently uh, running and operating. With this, I want to thank you for listening. And I also want to thank the team uh, for doing the work and getting this done. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Why we enjoy the drone flight, uh, wonderful. I'm working in the lignite pits of the central Rhineland. We don't have that thing. So are there any immediate questions to Stefan uh, before we go uh, to our uh, panel? Um, yes, Peter. Peter Edon. Hi. I naively would assume that I don't have to do this uh, optimization of the pulse over and over. So why is it? Not sure whether I know what you mean over and over, so you have to do it once. And if you do it once, then if you assume that the system is super stable, then you don't have to do it again. However, that's also not reality. So you have to recalibrate from time to time. That's another issue that you will have. And also this what I talk, the time it takes is just because you have to measure the system and find this optimal value of the pulses. And if you have many parameters, then that's typically for control schemes, the more parameters you have, the more time it takes. And the quantum system you have to have, you have to gather statistics while measuring. So that's the time it takes. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And you know, uh, you have seen that uh, we have entered uh, the nerd zone to the point that the speaker was citing my papers. Thank you for that. So let's now switch, as um, uh, Stefan Rank has already started, to po panel discussion mode. And um, I think all three have been introduced in these slides. Do you want to transition to the panel discussion, Stefan, or we just keep talking? We don't hear you, but I assume we just keep talking. He looks very non-worried. Um, yes. So, and actually, let's uh, pick up uh, uh, with uh, Stefan Philipp. You know, we um, I enjoyed your talk very much, but uh, of course, uh, you presented it extremely well. But of course, we have a broad spectrum of interests and backgrounds in our audience. So can you help us a little bit to summarize how 
the general topic of quantum error handling, the big topic um, of getting the most out of hardware, how your um, presentation locks into this topic. So we have to basically kind of see the high level. level. Yeah. We have to see that there is different types of errors. And in principle, what is the high level description is we don't want to have any errors. And even for error correction codes, we have to make them as small as possible or the overhead basically in coping with them grows. And that's kind of error handling has to go in the different directions and avoiding them from the very beginning by better control, by longer coherence, or finding some methods to mitigate those or finding the method to control those. I think that's the, the high level. Avoid errors and if they are there, try to make the effort as efficient and as small as possible uh, to run al algorithms. We should always keep in mind for the audience that as high tech as these qubits are, they are absolutely not ideal in the sense of mathematical model. Stefan and I just uh, contributed to a semi-popular science volume of the German Physical Society. And uh, one statement I always wanted to make in public is that the word qubit has two meanings. One thing is something a programmer would like to use. And another thing is a physical system that implements it. And they are so not the same. Then uh, this is bridging this gap. So can you, uh, Stefan, uh, second question also to you. Can you um, then help us a little bit uh, uh, put this into context of quantum error suppression, mitigation, correction? We are hearing these uh, uh, terms and, you know, you as a professor can probably help us with the definition and the uh, the difference of those. I guess you don't want to really hear the definition of those. I don't know whether there is there even is a definition, for example, of what is error mitigation, but kind of just getting the idea. Mm -hmm. So what is error suppression? Work on noise channels of the hardware of the system itself. You, you don't want to have noise at all. So do the best you can in getting the best hardware functionality. Try the best in getting the best of the control um, electronics and do the best in avoiding errors directly at the hardware. If you can do this, I mean, if you could do this perfectly, Frank, you put it, there is not a perfect qubit, but try to get as close as possible to the perfect qubit. That makes your life easier because then you can start thinking about error mitigation. We saw error mitigation schemes and these error mitigation schemes, they rely on gathering information about how this noise acts on the system. For example, the zero noise extrapolation, you do something, you do, play your um, pulses slightly differently, but that means you have to do more measurements. So you have to do more efforts or you encode it in more qubits and then gather uh, more data to mitigate these errors. That's still not error correction because error correction then really takes the coherence during the coherence of the system, tries to identify, tries to ask, ask the question, was there an error? Yes or no? And depending on whether the answer is yes or no, we do something to the system. So keeping this whole coherent story, this evolution, this quantum algorithm running for the entire time. And that's basically the holy grail. Then you have to record, and then you also have to do something to the system. Where in error mitigation, it's more like you record data and you do something in post-processing to find out what is the effect of the error on the algorithm. So your, what you presented uh, reduces the effort on the next levels, if you want. Uh, I would say the hardware challenge is to make the effort of what comes beyond that easier. Mm -hmm. So Stefan just mentioned uh, that error mitigation is usually done in post-processing. But if you paid attention to uh, Glenn's presentation, in his method, a lot is done during the computation. You know, the, uh, the big bang of quantum error mitigation was a paper by Kandala, which was also all post-processing. And... Uh, Stefan, uh, sorry, Glenn called his work still error mitigation. So in what sense is this um, really part of the quantum error mitigation part? Um, and what does this technique mean for really reaching quantum advantage in the NISC regime, which is the holy grail? Uh, yes. So uh, actually, now we're doing NISC devices, and uh, these devices are uh, highly prone to errors. So we do not expect to be able to run very deep circuit on the device for a very long computation without stopping and doing something. 
So these error schemes, these uh, error mitigation schemes that I'm presenting are suitable to run when the device is not running for a long time. If the device runs for a very long time, we would need to do this kind of uh, error correction, which does something on the fly, right? As Stefan was saying, you have to do this. Uh, uh, it's not even necessarily measuring, but you have to do this correction uh, during the computation. What we do now is we consider a particular algorithm that uh, uses the quantum device uh, multiple times. So it does multiple calls to the quantum device. And this is how this uh, optimization algorithm that I described works. And in this case, uh, the algorithm from uh, beginning to end requires uh, uh, asking the, uh, the computer to compute many times. And each of these times we can apply this error mitigation algorithm. And that's why we can apply the error mitigation many times during, during the computation. So I think this is an indication that this kind of algorithms are somehow more convenient for, for near-term devices because they allow us to correct the error e in an easier way. Okay, thank you. So Stefan, would you, what's your comment on this non-traditional but very efficient uh, error mitigation? Yeah, but I would kind of agree that the distinction is that you have this on the fly correction and then you can run as long algorithms as you wish, or you do something with more NISC type shorter algorithms, and then you kind of have to rerun the sequence and then query the system more often. So I would still say it kind of belongs more to this error mitigation method. But at the end, I mean, the result is that we have a method that works efficiently to cope with these errors. And that's, I think, the most uh, practically the most relevant thing. Great. Thank you. So let's come to uh, Amin, who has shown us very impressive results. And I'm looking really forward to the paper on how this uh, NREM uh, can be more efficient. But you do need a relation to the physical error, which you somehow have to uh, guess or as we say in the business model. So do you think you can uh, improve this going away, uh, going beyond the guess in future? Sure. So actually, this is what we are already trying to achieve. Um, we have tested several ideas along that line. And I can tell that um, we already achieved something. I actually briefly mentioned that we also have a refined version of NREM. And in this refined version, we particularly could manage to even further reduce the bias error and also probably more importantly, we could also reduce the sampling overhead. So yes, we have done something and we are continuing um, along this line. Mm -hmm. At some point, I point you to a paper of us about unbiasing the error, but um, sure. you also showed uh, great theoretical simulations and in the end, a shiny chip. So uh, what's your expectation um, related to experimental demonstration of your method? Right, sure, sure. So this we will actually start doing in the near future, probably in one month or so, I should all, but I should also say that we have already been doing, um, trying to implement error mitigation on, on hardware. And so far we implemented, for example, readout error mitigation and also a standard zero noise extrapolation. But NREM, we aim to first finish the paper, uh, the theoretical development, and then we will start mm -hmm. in experimental implementation. Stefan, you think that some, this is something that can be experimentally validated? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I liked it really much. I mean, it goes in the direction of that brute force zero noise extrapolation is something that you can do, but uh, be more clever about this, save time on your running the experiment, being more efficient in extracting what you can know about the system. I think that's uh, that's the way to go, to just make these schemes more efficient. Mm -hmm. Um, going a little bit uh, to uh, broader topics, um, now that we hope we're getting closer to quantum advantage, we see that it has many facets. There is quantum advantage, there is quantum utility, quantum usefulness, all of these kind of buzzwords going through the discussion sphere. Um, Glenn, what is quantum utility? And um, is that something we should focus on? Or uh, what's the sense of that? Yes, maybe you should start answering if we should focus on it, I would mm -hmm. definitely say yes. And let me explain what it is and why. So for a long time, uh, the focus has been on trying to prove that uh, quantum computers 
uh, are suitable to run computation and can theoretically achieve advantage. But now that the uh, hardware is in a more mature state, uh, various company and research groups are actually trying to tackle the issue of what we can do with this quantum computer. So, the, so now the problem is if we have a problem and we att attempt to solve it with a quantum computer, when does it become more convenient to solve this problem with a quantum computer than solving it with classical hardware? And this is quantum utility. So it may be that it's uh, more, it's, we can solve it faster, uh, it costs less in terms of money, it occupies less space. There are various factors that have to be taken into account when evaluating whether uh, it's use, more useful to use a quantum device. And they do not necessarily require that there is any mathematical theorem saying that one algorithm is better, one method is better than the other. We just need to know that. Uh, uh, as the state of art of things are it's now, it's better to use a quantum device to solve this certain task. And this is definitely important in industry. I mean, people want to know whether they should use it or not. So sometimes you're using a quantum computer, even though strictly speaking, years later, you discover that a classical computer would have done it. Um, and that's the difference between uh, utility for, for users and uh, academic advantage. We should keep in mind that Albert Einstein got the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect for postulating photons, which was correct, but unnecessary. So we're in good company. Um, so um, it's typically speculated that quantum utility starts at the 150 qubits level in the NISC era and with two qubit gate fidelities of three to four nine. So with gate errors about 0.01%. Now we're getting closer to it. Now we have to lay our cards at the table. What kind of advantage can we really reach? I mean, at this level. Right. So I think at this level, one, one interesting thing that people can look at is certainly align quantum simulations. For example, we are thinking about time dynamics of Fermi Hubbard model. And of course, Fermi Hubbard model is one candidate to get that can potentially explain high temperature superconductivity. So it would be really interesting to use quantum processors to analyze some uh, quantum many body systems. Um, additionally, at that scale, perhaps we can do something also along the line of quantum chemistry, for example, trying to analyze a small scale molecule. Um, this also, we have a working line on that. Um, uh, and also, I, I guess, generally speaking, one can analyze many optimization problems and machine learnings. Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, wrapping everything we have together, the look into the future and uh, quantum error handling. What will? What do you expect? What is the future of quantum error handling? Will it stay important? Will it become obsolete as hardware improves? Is it something that users see or something that's dug in the stack? You know, it's like the firmware of your car. You. You don't see it, you just trust that it works. Uh, what's your expectation here? Maybe start with Glenn, the future of quantum error handling. Yeah, sure. So actually, uh, error handling is uh, extremely important and uh, it's important in uh, quantum devices as it's important in classical devices. So classical devices now work pretty well, but there are still error correction algorithm, error mitigation, error correction algorithm that work under the carpet. So we do not see them maybe directly, but they are at work when we are using our laptops and our computers. Otherwise we would have bit flipping because of some uh, external, uh, external noise and everything would not work. Instead, we are able to use, compute and use this device robustly. So definitely it's going to be important uh, even later. And as things are now, it's extremely, it's even more important because uh, the way we do these algorithms and we project these algorithms depend also on the kind of errors we have on the devices. And we have to try to, uh, since the resources are limited at the moment, we have to try to wo the work together, but with, uh, uh, experimentalist and uh, theorist so that we can bring together an algorithm that uses both the best uh, from uh, that we have uh, on both sides. So we cannot just uh, project algorithm individually and we cannot just build hardware without thinking about the algorithm that will run on them. I mean, anything to add on the future of uh, quantum error? 
Sure. I mean, I think it's clear that in the far future, people will rely on quantum error correction. I think in some some future, which is not that far, but not also very close, it should be also uh, very important to try to make a bridge between quantum error mitigation and quantum error correction. For example, do a small quantum, a partial error correction for Clifford gates and partial error mitigation for non-Clifford gates can be found something. And also there are ways to improve with still quantum error mitigation in some hybrid format, which is a like a combination of noise aware and noise agnostic. Mm -hmm. um, but nothing of this makes sense without hardware. So Stefan, as an experimentalist, uh, what's your expectation on, on the future of that? Yeah, just the final statement basically on that is also, don't forget about the hardware. We have to improve coherence. We have to constantly work in getting the hardware better and better. And that's kind of also, if we forget about that, it won't work and it has to be a combination, but hardware coherence and control errors have to be uh, uh, under control. Yeah. There seems to be a universal quantum Matthews principle in the sense that the better your underlying technology is, the more efficient the layers above will be. So he who has will be given. Um, that is uh, almost Christmassy. And uh, thanks uh, to all the speakers and the panelists for their presentations. We are slightly over time, sorry for that, but I hope you enjoyed this discussion as much as I did. There's a final announcement and we are leaving the heavy nerd zone and go back to the big picture of the state of quantum. Stefan, any final announcements? Stefan Rank? I think we had great uh, talks today and we look forward to meet uh, everybody uh, next year. Thank you. So with that, I wish you a pleasant rest of the day. And for those who I uh, won't meet again, um, have a great holiday season. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.